may I also welcome um, those that are joining us virtually and um, particularly say thank you to those of you that have taken the time to come into uh, Election House. May I begin by first uh, introducing uh, your panel for today and who um, is accompanying the panel. On my right hand side is the chairperson of the Electoral uh, Commission, Mr. Glenn Machini. Uh, on the far right hand side of uh, our guest of honor is Commissioner Miedra. On my left hand side is uh, the vice chairperson of the Electoral Commission, uh, Commissioner uh, Love, Janet Love. And on her left hand side is the chief electoral officer of the Electoral Commission. We have in the room uh, members of the executive committee of the Electoral Commission sitting here. We've got uh, members of uh, the senior management of the Electoral Commission and um, a number of uh, colleagues from the, from the Electoral Commission. Um, at this point in time, I'd also like to introduce you to a person that you know very well. Um, on the 20th of May, uh, 2021, not so long ago, we came, we were in this room when we introduced um, Justice um, Deham Seneke. And he is here today on this momentous day, I think, uh, to give us feedback on what has transpired in the few weeks that he has been um, doing the tasks that he was assigned to do. I am not uh, going to take a lot of your time. Uh, my name is Nomsa Masubu. I'm one of the five commissioners of the Electoral Commission. <coughs> and my job is the usual one. I seem to be the per perennial um, program director. Uh, at this point in time, I am going to invite the chairperson of the Electoral Commission to explain why we are here and what the objectives of today um, are. Chairperson, may I hand over to you? Uh, thank you, Program Director, Dr. Masubu, uh, former uh, Deputy Justice Dihang Mosinege, and the members of your team, fellow commissioners, as already introduced, together with our Chief Electoral Officer present here, uh, members of the Electoral Commission Executive team and senior management with us here today and members of the fourth estate present here, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the commission, let me express our gratitude and appreciation to you, uh, Justice Musineke, as well as your esteemed team. Uh, that is here with us, that is involved with you in the inquiry into ensuring free and fair elections during COVID-19. And as we all know, this inquiry has been conducted under extremely tight timelines necessitated by the constitutional imperatives for us to hold the local government elections before the 1st of November. Despite these pressures, Justice Musnege and uh, your team, you were able to accept our request as to whether you can undertake the inquiry as already stated uh, by the program director on the 20th of May this year. And uh, in just 61 days, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Justice Musnege and the team have managed to conduct an in-depth, comprehensive, and a, a transparent um, process and investigation into whether uh, holding elections would be free and fair under the COVID-19 uh, on the date of the um, of October, and. Uh, we are very pleased that uh, 
Justice Musinege has managed uh, to hand over a, a final report uh, a, that we are in a position that we can share it with yourselves as as was originally agreed that you will be in a position to complete the task and interestingly is finished it a day earlier than the planned date. So on behalf of the commission, allow me to then thank and express our sincere appreciation uh, to all those who participated in this uh, robust inquiry. And these, among others, include our key stakeholders, the political parties, the election practitioners, the civil society, the state representative and, and, and institutions, uh, various uh, uh, subject, uh, subject matter experts in health and in forecasts, as well as many other people from all walks of life that uh, you know the justice will share with us uh, who those participants were and uh, we know that everybody was working under extreme pressure uh, during this period yet the time to contribute to this process and ensured at least that there was a diversity of considerations so we are pleased then and thankful uh, that the South African public in general showed an, a phenomenal interest in this particular issue. And we like to thank uh, all uh, South Africans who were able to provide uh, the information for the inquiry to proceed. And uh, reporting on each aspect of this, especially the live broadcasts and oral submissions it did enable us and uh, we appreciated that the media showed such a keen interest as well as was able to allow the, the provide a platform for the diversity of the views and debate to be, uh, to, be to be heard and today we are grateful once again that uh, you as members of the fourth estate are here with us and uh, in the final journey of the uh, report. And we'd like to thank the South African media for its support throughout this exercise. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just briefly indicate that as we all know, the commission took the decision to embark on this inquiry to help us as the commissioners and our stakeholders to better understand the many complexities surrounding whether to proceed with the local government elections as scheduled for the 27th of October, 2021. And we did so by invoking for the first time ever uh, the section 14.4 of the Electoral Commission uh, 51 of 1996, which provides that, I quote, the commission may, if it deemed necessary, publish a report on the likelihood or otherwise that it will be able to ensure uh, any that any election will be pending election will be free and fair close quote and in that we shared with yourselves that the terms of reference for the inquiry uh, were as follows to summarize them one was to review and assess all factors which may have a bearing on whether the elections will be free and fair. And secondly, to recommend any further measures the commission may take to further ensure the freeness and fairness of the elections, which ensuring the safety of all the participants. The commission earlier than today had the privilege of receiving a presentation summarizing the report uh, from Justice uh, Musineke and as well as the key findings. And I will shortly invite Justice Musineke to share with you uh, an overview of the key, key elements of this particular report, 
which we believe this will still be in line with uh, the uh, transparency that the Commission has uh, made uh, ensured that is, it is part of this particular process. But what is clear is that uh, the Musnega inquiry has also significantly contributed to the national uh, the, the conversation about what constitutes uh, freeness and fairness of the elections. And the constitutional complexities involved in elections, including balancing of legal and social aspects of our democracy, have indeed clearly emerged during this particular process. And what has also emerged is the significant difference of perspective on this matter from the wide range of the people who made submissions, in particular, the South African community. Therefore, the commission hopes that, that this final report on the inquiry would not only assist the commission in making a final determination regarding the upcoming local government election, but will also contribute to the emergence of a national consensus on what constitutes necessary free and fair elections and how we can ensure the safety of the voters, the candidates, elections, uh, staff, as well as all the participants. And having received this report, ladies and gentlemen, from Justice Musenege today, the commission now will retreat to study the report in depth, to understand not only the recommendation, but all the hol uh, holistic aspects of the report. And uh, we have noted that it's a weighty report, uh, Justice, and uh, on a weighty matter that will require a weighty consideration on our part. And uh, over the coming uh, days, it is the intention of the Commission to study the inquiry report in depth, secondly, to engage with a range of key stakeholders regarding its findings and recommendations. And this will include our key stakeholders, that is political parties via the political party liaison committee system, along with the various key role, uh, role players. And then to make a final determination regarding the local government election within the next uh, few days. Uh, and the commission has scheduled a meeting uh, to begin this particular process. And in the meantime, uh, the commission has uh, come to agreement to agreed that the, the report to publish the report on, it, uh, uh, on the website today in the interest of uh, transparency and furthering this national discussion. So people would be in a position, uh, Justice, to apply themselves to the report alongside us as the commission when we are looking into the report. Until then, the commission is in a position to make its final uh, uh, pronouncement on, on the report. Ladies and gentlemen, the commission is acutely aware of the weight of its responsibility to find the correct balance between protecting people's lives and safeguarding our democracy project. And we are without any shed of doubt uh, of the view, the work of Justice Musineke uh, has actually greatly enhanced our national discourse on a free and fair election, especially within the abnormal circumstances we find ourselves. Once again, on behalf of the Commission, let me express our gratitude and uh, appreciation to you, Justice, and your team. And I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, at this point in time, may I invite you, uh, Justice Musaneke, to uh, deliver to the nation uh, a summary of your determination. Thank you. Dr. Masugu, thank you, um, Chairperson, <clears throat> and indeed all members of the, uh, of the Commission who are here present, 
and fellow members of, of the team who are all here present. Um, this morning, I handed this report to the chairperson um, of the Electoral Commission. It will be remembered that the report had been commissioned by the commission in terms of section 14.4 read together with section 5.2 of the Electoral Commission Act. These provisions authorize the com commission to publish a report on the likelihood or otherwise that a pending election will be free and fair. The need for the report was triggered by the onset of COVID-19 pandemic. The outcome of the report is of course not binding on the commission, which retains its constitutional and legislative mandate and duty to decide the conduct of elections in the country. It is however appropriate that this report was prepared um, and therefore we acknowledge this together with a very diligent and professional support of young attorneys and advocates Ms. Milabuchen Kekana, Ms. Catherine Kreyer, Ms. Fatima Mohammed, and Tabang Mabina, Mr. Uh, this report was prepared in great haste, in part because of the tight electoral timetable of the Commission. Even so, the current report runs through 120 pages and traverses considerable material by the contextual background to the applicable law on local government elections, the COVID-19 pandemic, and its likely impact on free and fair elections. It covers and traverses the right to life, to bodily and psychological integrity, access to health care, which are self-evidently threatened by the ominous rate of infections, the hospitalization and deaths associated with different uh, recurrent ways of the COVID-19 pandemic. About that a little more very shortly. This report carefully records and examines the submissions of the commission and stakeholders, including political parties, the public, civil society organizations, organized media, organized business, labor and civil society under the purview of NETLAC, National Education, I mean, Economic Development Labor Council, and a public opinion survey. The inquiry went on to receive and hear submissions from independent electoral monitoring bodies whose submissions, amongst others, prompted this inquiry to study and compare electoral practice in our country, the rest of the African continent, and elsewhere in the world in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The inquiry went on to receive written and oral submissions from organizations focused on healthcare, independent medical experts, from government functionaries that included the Director General of the Department of Health, medical experts, scientists related to or serving within the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19, established by the Minister of Health, and from the Minister of the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. The central issue you will remember is whether the local government elections are scheduled for the October 21st are likely to be held in a free and fair manner. The political parties and civil society organizations that made submissions to the inquiry are fiercely divided on whether the elections, if held, are likely to be free and fair. In this report, we represent these divergent views and have preserved the submissions in their original form on our website. While submissions by political parties, civil society, and members of the public are instructive and important, this report does not make any factual findings on or assess the cogency of the positions advanced by these stakeholders. This is so because the respective political views are not susceptible to a fact-finding process. They are often driven and animated by their partisan and subjective worldviews, or even by self-interest. To that extent, the inquiry heeded 
and respected all views and deemed each to carry equal force, whatever the size or pedigree of the political party concerns. The inquiry sought to find an objective and dependable standards that is suited to, the, to measure whether the pending elections are likely to be free and fair in the face of the threat to life and limb and access to health care posed by infections, hospitalization and deaths spawned by a pandemic on our country and its population. The outcome of inquiry has reached, the outcome of the inquiry, the outcome the inquiry has reached, I'm sorry, is not and must not be driven by positions and preferences of political actors or entities of society, civil society. Important as all these views are and must be, public opinion too is extremely divided. We have rather tend to our constitution and the electoral law. First, we've looked at the electoral response to the pandemic in our country and thereafter in the rest of the African continent and in other significant electoral destinations abroad. Thereafter, we've sought to be guided by the science related to COVID-19 pandemic. That explains why we have heard submissions and presentations from no less than nine medical experts and scientists, including state functionaries tasked with the care of the impact of the pandemic. This report carefully records the core presentations of these experts and delineates their convergence and divergences on the research data, projections, and expert opinion they have tendered. First question that we must ask is whether local governments may ever be postponed. The starting point must surely be our constitution. It tells us that ours is a democratic state founded on universal adult suffrage and regular elections. What is telling is that the regularity of elections like a democratic form of governance is a founding value so highly cherished that it may not be amended except by a supermajority of 75% of members of the National Assembly and a supporting vote of at least six provinces. In plain language, our constitution commands that a term of a municipal council may be no more than five years. And when <clears throat> the term expires, an election must be held within 90 days of the expiry. As we have earlier recorded in this report, electoral legislation accords with constitutional stricture on the term of municipal councils. Local government elections may be postponed if they are likely not to be free and fair, but to a date within the mandatory term of five years and 90 days. However, in sharp contrast, the constitution of the law do not provide for an extension of the term of a municipal council. The first order answer to this initial question is that local government elections must be held within 90 days of expiry of the fixed term of five years, and the constitution does not contemplate a deferment. Well, we also know that in our democratic order, elections must not only be regular, but they must also be free and fair. The constitution does not create an optional binary that says election must be regular, but need not be free and fair or that they must be free and fair, even if they are not regular. Elections that are not free and fair, even if held regularly, are not democratic elections at all. The two requirements must coexist and be co-present at every election held under our jurisdiction. It seems to me there are two ways to approach the fixed term set by the constitution and other law for municipal council. The first option suggests itself is to seek to amend the constitution and applicable legislation. 
It may be said, but it is an undesirable democratic practice to amend the constitution on an ad hoc basis or to solve a particular short-term challenge. Even a bigger challenge is that the amendment will require 75% supermajority in order to be effected. Then the question must follow. May a court of competent jurisdiction grant or permit the extension or relaxation of a fixed term deliberately set by the constitution? Happily, our current assignment does not require us to answer that difficult question, which we respectfully leave for courts to decide. We propose not to second guess our courts. It may be argued though that a court of competent jurisdiction may want to assume jurisdiction to extend the limited term of office of municipal council to a finite date. If it is shown that exceptional and compelling circumstances warrant the extension. Such circumstances could include elections that are likely to be a nullity because they were not free and fair or dire circumstances like a pandemic that massively threatened life or limb or other consideration of necessity that render compliance with the constitutional dictate impossible or exceptionally hazardous. Well, we then tend to what is quite obvious with the local government elections of October 2021 be free and fair. What our current assignment requires us to answer is whether the local elections set for October 2021 are likely to be free and fair. Having considered all the submissions of stakeholders, applicable law, research on electoral practice during the COVID-19 pandemic and the related signs, we conclude that it is not reasonably possible or likely that the local government elections scheduled for the month of October 2021 will be held in a free and fair manner as required by the peremptory provisions of the constitution and related legislation. And we go further to find that the scheduled elections are likely to be free and fair if they were to be held, not later than the end of the month of February 2022. But what are the grounds for this decision? The first, when an election has been called, the commission must prepare a timetable for elections. Any act required to be performed in relation to the election must be performed by no later than the time stated in the election timetable. On the current draft timetable, the voter registration is now scheduled for the 31st of July and the 1st of August, 2021. And only thereafter may elections be called. It is planned, we are told, that the minister will call the elections not later than the 6th of August, 2021. Now the scheduled voter registration weekend is six days from the end of the current adjusted let level four restrictions, whose currency may be extended beyond that date, being the 25th of July, 2021. We conclude that if elections were to proceed as scheduled now, most of the acts required to be performed in accordance with the draft timetable will not be reasonably possible, starting with a face-to-face -face registration of voters who do not have access to electronic registration, the provincial and final certification of the voter's role, and the finalization of the nomination process for registered parties and independent candidates. This is so because the subsisting lockdown restrictions will stand in the way of parties and independent candidates accomplishing acts prescribed by the timetable and electoral laws. The next reason, from March 2020 until June 2021, the commission approached the electoral court on eight occasions to seek orders postponing the holding of by-elections. 
The court granted the orders on each case. The commission's first application was brought two days after the president announced that a national state of disaster was being proclaimed to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. The remaining seven applications were brought when the country was placed under alert level two to five. And for these applications, the commission advanced four broad bases for seeking the postponement that its work will be hindered in preparing for and conducting the by-elections in a free and fair manner, that infections spreading through the holding of election activities that make it possible for elections to be safe, that the, the government's measures and efforts to curb the spread of infections would be undermined, that restrictions on gatherings of political activities would impede free and fair elections. And fourthly, that the population was more aware about the risk of infections coupled with the existence of highly transmissible new variants of the virus. There was a real possibility that the voters would have stayed away from the polls. Now this report finds no fault in the attitude of the commission as just described. Much as the commission has often proclaimed that it is technically ready to conduct elections, historically it has also made correct call that measures promulgated by the government to curve continued spread of the pandemic had an adverse impact on the likelihood of the by-elections being free and fair. The concern is justified that under a state of national disaster, with restrictions in place on the movement of persons and gatherings, political parties and independent candidates will not be able to freely participate in the forthcoming local government elections. And voters will not have the opportunity to exercise rights that are essential to the conduct of free and fair elections. The concern is heightened when South Africa is placed under an alert level that imposes more severe restrictions during the run up to and at the time earmarked for local government elections. Freedom to participate in elections is an element fundamental to the conduct of free and fair elections. This includes the freedom to canvass, to advertise, to engage in activities normal for a person seeking election. While the constitution and the law are not prescriptive as to the manner in which public campaign and adver advertise, the activities normal for a person seeking election in South Africa includes the holding of large, large rallies, the holding of smaller political gatherings, the door-to-door -door campaigns. However, we add the freeness and fairness of local government elections must be evaluated in the context which includes the new normal imposed upon us by COVID-19 pandemic. What is important is that political parties and independent candidates must be able to participate in the elections fully and effectively. This means that they must be able to get their political message to their chosen electorate. Although the restrictions on movement of persons and gatherings under the disaster management regulations apply to all political parties and candidates, there is likely to be a disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 restrictions on smaller, less resourced political parties and independent candidates. Larger, well-resourced political parties will more easily be able to advertise widely and shift to digital platforms to engage with, with voters. And lastly, the restrictions on the ability of political parties and independent candidates to campaign in turn diminish just the rights of the electorate, including the right to vote. It has long been established that the effective exercise of the right to vote requires access to information. If voters are able to receive political messaging from political parties and independent candidates, they'll be hindered in their ability to make political choices and to vote. A legitimate question may then be asked, what if the lockdown restrictions higher than level one were removed? I think the ready answer is that on all medical expert predictions, during October 2021, infections, hospitalization, and mortality will remain a significant threat to the physical well-being and life until a substantial number of our population 
has been vaccinated. Talking about medical evidence, that's what I turn to now. As we have seen, the question whether scheduled local government elections of October 2021 should be held or deferred is fiercely contested within and amongst election stakeholders of varied kinds. Some stakeholders have urged us to find and follow medical signs, and others have scoffed at the reliance on signs. We choose to hit the signs, and to that end solicited the assistance of no less than nine leading medical and public health experts in our country. They are Dr. Aslam Dasur, Dr. Farid Abdullah, Professor Shabir Madi, Dr. Sandile Butelezi, Director General of Health of the Department of Health, Professor Salim Abdul Karim, Dr. Jackie Moy, Professor Shital Silal from the Advisory Committee of the Health Department, Dr. Harry Moultrie from the National Institute of Communicable Disease, and Professor Susan Goldstein. The material presented by the scientists displayed substantial convergence. The differences among them are limited in the main to the likely trajectory of the virus and the resultant infections, hospitalization and deaths in October, 2021, compared to February, March, 2022. We set out briefly the convergence and later individualized divergence on the predictions. The experts are at one that available data shows that the country is amid a third wave of COVID-19 infections. By the time the oral hearings were held, the Delta variant was the dominant strain of the virus in South Africa and indeed in the world. Hospital admissions and deaths followed the rise of infections. It is difficult to predict the, tra the trajectory of the pandemic, experts tell us, with any certainty for many reasons. The virus is constantly evolving. Its variants are unpredictable and they are not going away any time too soon. The variable geographic areas of high infections as infections spread. The uncertainty is worsened by the population's COVID-19 fatigue. That means that the population is not consistently adhering to the recommendation, recommended non-pharmaceutical interventions. Next, the expert drew attention to rising infections and the impact on hospitalization and mortality. The Delta variant can spread much faster and large numbers of people need hospitalization and medical care. During the second wave of the pandemic, the hospitalization, we are told, rose very rapidly. Professor Abdul Karim stated that anything that exacerbates the spread of this variant just makes matters much worse. Professor Mahdi made identical observations of a rising third wave. Around 7 June 2021, five of the nine provinces were experiencing this third wave. However, he added national immunity may not at this stage be relevant if there are further variations of the virus that may make it resistance to immunity from past infections. Then the experts tend to capacity of the health system and excess mortality. In dealing with the rising wave, Dr. Abdullah reflected on the ability of the health services to respond to COVID-19 pandemic. He measured the response of the health services during the first and the second and third wave Using this information, consider the capacity of the health services to deal with the fourth and future waves to be unsatisfactory and inadequate. Dr. Dasu added that the country's healthcare system has not been able to create special capacity to manage the third wave, and it's unlikely that it will be able to do so in the fourth wave. The national response reveals deep dysfunctions in governance, he says, and a poor state capacity in what should be regarded as a public health emergency. The experts continue to agree that there is a significant undercounting of COVID deaths in our country. 
underreporting is extensive, they say. Deaths are underreported because hospitals are only are often remarkably busy or they are not very well uh, suited for the job. The excess death reports produced by the Medical Research Council provide a good lens through which one can observe the trends of the pandemic to the mortality rates. The effect of the underreporting of excess deaths is that threat to live and live is much higher than the official number of COVID-19 deaths suggests. The official mortality rate from COVID-19 then was reported around 58,000. The excess mortality rate from the Medical Research Council, however, records a figure as high as 180,000. On this account of excess mortality, it seems to us that the actual figures of COVID-19 mortality are about three times higher than the official reports of deaths. Dr. Dassou added that it was common cause among the scientific community. And on our inquiry, we got comparable access mortality figures that represented the inquiry by Professor Silal, Dr. Moultrie of the Modeling Consortium. Another common position of the experts is that patterns or subsequent waves of infections tend to be similar and follow a similar trajectory to that of infections in the first and second waves in our country. On the assumption that no new variant will emerge from now until October 2021, the October 2021 will be a period of low infections. This means the present Delta-driven third wave is predicted to peak and thereafter decline during August and September 2021, depending on varied trajectories of different provinces in our country. If this pattern holds, they all agree that October 2021 will be a period of relatively low transmission. And what about community immunity and vaccines? The experts tell us that vaccines are better at protecting against severe disease and death than at protecting against mild symptomatic illness. If one makes one important assumption that virus does not change, then it will be worthwhile to try to get some level of community immunity, which will substantially reduce the risk of hospitalization and death in our country. Currently, South Africa has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the world, they tell us, and the highest rates of COVID-19 fatalities. With varying emphasis, the experts agree that it is necessary to strive for community immunity, and that given the vaccination rate, it will not be possible for South Africa to achieve community immunity by October 2021. All experts agreed with Professor Muddy that there is an extent of natural immunity derived from previous infections with the beta and delta variants. And this will play a role in the situation going forward. They added that the United Kingdom is having another surge of infections, but the death rate is flat. South Africa must get to that stage, they say. South Africa is behind the global rate of, investigation, of vaccination. South Africa must reach a stage where there is a decline in deaths. And this can be achieved by vaccinating the most at risk population, namely those who have comorbidities and are above a certain age. I'm afraid that includes me, Chairperson. <laughs> South Africa should aim to administer 300 doses of the vaccine daily. Risk associated with elections, all experts tell us, express themselves on the risk associated with elections and are agreed. Large gatherings are super spreader events. This cannot be emphasized enough, Professor Mahdi said. Professor Mahdi added that no gatherings cannot be allowed during the run-up to elections, even on voting day. This, he added, is not negotiable. He urged strongly that no gatherings should be allowed. Elections are likely to cause a resurgence of infections, and any resurgence will be difficult to manage. As a mitigatory measure, when elections do proceed, he suggests that voting should, stations should be located outdoors as a preferred option. Professor Abdul Karim speaks of five risks of transmission that arise with election activities. 
occupational exposures for the commission staff and campaign staff, door-to-door -door visits, small group meetings, large group rallies, marches, and voting day queues and polling booth risks. These are three principal risks associated with these activities, namely gatherings, especially those indoors, movement of people, level of adherence to non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions. In short, large group rallies and marches are bound to be super spreader events. Dr. Abdullah is aware that the limitation of gatherings translates to restrictions on electioneering. He cautions that if the scale tilts in favor of electioneering activities, when the transmission rates of the Delta variant are high, the events will become seeding events and will lead to cluster outbreaks and in turn trigger another wave. Ordinarily, gatherings have been shown to be super spreaders. Then we moved on to the inquiry on the difference I'm sorry, on October 2021 versus February, March 2021. There's a difference of opinion amongst experts on when it would be less risky or safer to hold elections between October 2021 and later February, March 2022. Professor Abdul Karim presented that if the elections were delayed by three months, South Africa would be in low transmission and concludes that that is the time that is the moment that elections should be held, being October 2021, rather than three months later. Professor Karim is of the view that we are likely to see several new variants around March 2022. Professor Madi, on the other hand, pointed out that it's difficult to predict the trajectory of the virus, particularly for October 2021. He said the major risk lies in the period leading to voting day electioneering, especially large outdoor gatherings, and any indoor gatherings of more than 20 people will have a major impact on the resurgence of the infections. Based on past patterns with waves one and two, it may be that October 2021 is a period of relative calm with a resurgence in December 2021 onwards. Dr. Abdullah is of the view that continuing with current plans to hold elections in October puts thousands of lives at risk. The country or parts of it will remain at different stages of a wave for a foreseeable future. He recommends that elections be postponed until mortality rates decline. The country must reach a stage where there is a flattening of hospitalization and a mortality curve. Conducting elections in February, March will certainly save more lives than in October, 2021 because of higher levels of vaccination and related immunity. It will be remembered that in their submissions, Professor Silal, Dr. Moore and Dr. Moultrie expressed their personal opinion, opinions, not represent the advisory committee or the modeling consortium, that the more people that are vaccinated at the time of holding of elections, the more lives will be saved. They took the view that there will be many more people vaccinated in February, March, 2022, and expected less hospitalization and less deaths. This expert view, it will be remembered, of course with that of Dr. Butelezi of the health department, who warned against elections gathering and campaigning during October, 2021, and that community immunity through vaccination will have been reached by February 2021, when approximately 40 million of the population would have been vaccinated. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the foregoing paragraphs are a fair summation of the signs that ought to guide us. Whilst the Delta variant may have subsided somewhat during October 2021, the risk to our population of infection, serious illness, and consequential hospitalization and death will remain remarkably high. Our public care system is inadequate for the health demands spawned by the pandemic. Our death or mortality rates appear to be nearly three times more than the official statistics of death. 
That means the threat to life posed by the pandemic is much higher than meets the eye. All experts tell us that by holding elections in October 2021 or in February, March 2022, there is a potential risk of infection or even of a fourth wave. The real difference will be made by community immunity through vaccination. Even if community immunity at 67% of our population is not reached, in February, March 2022, there will be far less risk of hospitalization and death than there will be in October 2021. Before we turn to our recommendations on when, if deferred, elections should be held, we draw attention to the section on electoral experience in other countries on our continent and in other significant electoral destinations. We commend our research recorded in this report to those who are sticklers for detail and who love research. What is plain is that many countries around the world have postponed presidential, national and subnational elections due to the pandemic, and others have held elections despite the pandemic. It is indeed difficult to make a helpful comparison from country to country because of the diversity of the context within which the decision to defer to go ahead with the election was made. Let it suffice though, to draw attention to the studies on the presidential elections in the United States of America and the state assembly elections in India and the local government elections in Brazil during the pandemic. They didn't postpone, they went ahead. The recorded estimates of death associated with each of these elections run into staggering numbers. If you want the exact numbers, they sit in our report. Something we should not want to wish for ourselves and our country. Why then February 2022? We have already considered that deferring elections might be an unwelcome dent to our nation's democratic resolve and psyche. And yet we hope we've shown that we are in exceptional circumstances that pose a real direct and collective threat to our lives, to our bodily and psychological well-being, and I might well add to our livelihoods. Some have argued that deferment may encourage or initiate a slippery slope that might undermine the democratic project. We think that this argument has considerable force. Only the most compelling of reasons to justify the deferment of a term of elections set in the supreme and other law of our country. For that reason, our recommendation is that elections be deferred only once and to the earliest possible date to be determined as the safest and the shortest within which local government elections may be held without excessive loss of life. First, the local government elections world authority only because they are so authorized by the people who vote them into power. Second, once they assume office, their term of office is not only finite for five years, but also they must ensure accountable government and the provision of services in a sustainable manner. Many stakeholders in their submissions to us drew attention to the governance devastation to be found within the rest of most municipalities in our country. They rightly pressed that the current municipal councillors should be given not even one more day in office if citizens are to be spared more bouts of unaccountable government inept and dishonest financial accounting and downright failure to observe the law that governs municipalities. The consequence of this has been re re repeated service delivery protests in the face of dysfunctional and totally inept municipal councils. On the 30th of June, 2021, the Auditor General, Ms. Tsakani Maluleke, released her annual report on the audit outcomes of 257 municipalities for the financial year of 2019-2020. She recalls that the decline in affairs of the local government 
has been consistently reported by the Auditor General over the past four years of the current administration. The Auditor General bemoans the fact that there's been little evidence that the messages of the Auditor General have been taken to heart. It is saddening that the Auditor General finds that most municipalities are in a worse position than at the beginning of the administration term in 2016-2017. The Auditor General's report concludes that a clarion call for ethical and accountable leadership to drive the desired changes to bring about an improved local government. These are powerful considerations that ordinarily should militate against deferment of elections. At a local government level, South Africa is due for a reset. And ordinarily, local elections would be that reset button. We acknowledge that elections should be held, should be held soon but it cannot be at any cost. On all expert evidence, many, many lives are likely to be lost unless we reach a certain level of community immunity. The nearest point of safety will be February 2022, when there is likely to be a high level of community immunity. The postponement, therefore, should be no longer than it is strictly and reasonably necessary to save lives and limp. And lastly, the additional benefit of keeping the deferment as short as four months to February 2012 is that it will allow the newly elected municipal council to approve the annual budget for the new financial year. Although the annual budget cycle will commence before the elections are held in February 2022, the benefit of a short postponement is that the newly elected municipal councils will be in a position to consider the annual budget to be tabled in April 2022 and to approve the annual budget before the start of the new financial year on 1st July 2022. The incumbent municipal councils will need to commence the budget study process and should do so in accordance with the integrated development plans for their municipalities. The assignment for which we have been tasked includes indicating additional measures that the Commission may have to implement to realize free and fair elections within the COVID context. The measures we suggest are in line with our recommendation that local government elections be deferred to February 2022. And we have drawn upon international best practice to add to the already meticulous measures that the Electoral Commission suggests. <clears throat> Conclusion, having considered all submissions of stakeholders, applicable law, research on electoral practice during the COVID-19 pandemic and the related science, we again repeat, we conclude that it is not reasonably possible or likely that local government elections scheduled for the month of October 2021 will be held in a free and fair manner as required by the peremptory provisions of the constitution and related legislation. We find that the scheduled elections are likely to be free and fair if they're to be held not later than the end of the month of February 2022. We've also made recommendations on how free, fair and safe elections may be held in February 2022. Should the Commission accept these recommendations and seek to implement the outcome of this inquiry, it is self-evident that it must approach with deliberate speed a court of competent jurisdiction to seek a just and equitable order to defer the local government elections to a date not later than the end of the month of February 2022, and on such terms as the Honorable Court may grant. I thank you. Justice Sonneke, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you Justice. Sorry. <laughs> may I please uh, invite the Chairperson of the Electoral Commission just to make uh, a few remarks. South Africa, there you have it. Oh, report. 
I think uh, as the commission, we feel very much uh, pleased uh, with the thorough work that has been conducted by Justice uh, Mosineka. And as is pointed out now, that uh, everything is subject to that the commissioners here would they accept the report or not. And it is on those bases now that uh, the commission has requested that let the report be out there in the public domain and uh, then the commission will retreat and do its own uh, due processes, including engaging our key stakeholders. You would recall, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, when we announced this report, we clear that uh, it's happening under the auspices of our political party lines and uh, consultation processes. So we still need to, to do that uh, the soonest, but we very much appreciate the, the work that uh, Justice Musnege has done. It's, uh, it has shed a lot of light on some of the critical uh, considerations to enable the decision making by the, the commission. We thank all of you for all the uh, participation and involvement in, in, the, uh, in the inquiry. Um, I just need to check if any of fellow commissioners or colleagues mm -hmm. to you, the, the program director, if they have anything to add. Chairperson, I've just been instructed to give you the report <laughs> in full view of the cameras yes, now. I think, yes, and I think, yes. yes, it will be a good way to sign off. I've done my work. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I'm out of here. So, I agree, Mami, as you remind me. Now, I'm here some good Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I think even the PFMA will see that yeah. something was delivered. Uh, thank you very much to uh, both uh, Justice Misereke and the chairperson. I'd like to open the floor uh, to members of the media that might want to pose questions. Uh, it's just going to be a very brief window. Um, please remember to introduce, uh, to give us your name and the media house from which you come. Thank you very much. I can see you, sir, over there. Thank you so much. Franz Luara Machate from Progressive Independent News Agency. Um, to the Electoral Commission, the first question is, when you received this report this morning, what was the first thing that came into your mind? I know you will want to actually go through it and look at, at it thoroughly, but what was the first thing that came into your mind? The second question is, how possible is it that um, South Africa can have visual elections? Have you considered that? And how soon can we have that if, if possible? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Franz. I then go to you there. I can see you after that, uh, I, I can see you in Bali. Is it working? Please go ahead. Hi, um, it's Natasha Perry here from SABC News. I've just got a couple of questions and please bear with me, um, Um First and foremost, when will the IEC then come back um, to the general public and members of the media to share the final outcomes um, of this report by Justice Mutanek? And furthermore, in terms of the legislative framework, um, if you'll just explain to us in the layman's terms. So my understanding is that um, the last local government elections were on the 3rd of August, right, 2016. The 3rd of August, 2021 marks five years, right? 90 days will then end in November, right? Uh, and of course, Justice Musaneke had um, 
recommended that elections take place in February. Um, but are you not, in terms of the constitutional amendments, if the IEC decides that, yes, they will um, actually hold elections in February, are you not concerned about the process of the constitutional amendment? Because you first have to change it. This matter then needs to go back um, to, uh, the, I think, the par Parliament or the National Assembly, and details of the amendment, I think, need to be published for about 30 days. So is that also not a lengthy process um, in itself? And furthermore, some people have raised their concerns saying that, um, you know, power can easily be abused by the incumbent government to gain electoral advantage. Are you not concerned about that? And furthermore, um, I mean, how sure are we that, yes, I've heard that um, we probably will reach, uh, you know, herd immunity or community herd by um, February 2022, but are we not, how, how sure are we that we won't be in a fourth wave by that time? And then another related question, it's just in terms of online voter registration. I know that last week Wednesday, the process has been opened. Um, online, uh, sorry, not online registration, voter registration has been postponed to the 31st of July and the 1st of August. Does this now mean that because online registration is open, will that then, will we still see people physically going to voting stations, you know, to amend their addresses? on the 31st of um, July and the 1st of August. And in terms of the numbers as well, how many people voted online? Um, can the IEC assure us that the process uh, went on without any glitches? Thank you so much. Sorry for so many questions and I hope um, you got them all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna take um, Mbali and then pause and allow, um, and, and, uh, allow the panel and people outside the panel to fill the questions. Um, Mbali? Okay, uh, Mbali Tetani from Newsroom Africa. Um, I just wanna find out, I know that the, our commission said that uh, you will be studying the report um, and then get back to us, but I want to ask, uh, Justice Musaneka said that uh, you will need, in order for these elections to be postponed, you'll need to approach a higher court or a suitable court. Uh, when uh, will you be doing that? And uh, when will you be approaching this court? Can you give us a time frame? And also, um, you know, looking at uh, your calendar, it has now been disrupted. Uh, you know, what does it mean now for your plans as the IEC? Because you've already had, you know, the launch uh, of the elections. Uh, we've seen that take place. Uh, you have said you are technically ready. But how has this now affected your plans going forward uh, as the IEC? And do you have the capacity now to even look into uh, moving these elections on, uh, you know, in terms of planning? Uh, uh, for the IEC when you move these elections uh, to um, February 2022. Thank you. Okay. Chairperson of the Health Commission, um, those are the questions. Uh, please take as many of them as you can, uh, and then the rest we will apportion as necessary. Thank you, Program Director. Once again, let me thank uh, all the uh, let me thank uh, you all for the questions that uh, have been posed on us. Um, I think, uh, Franz, it's it's easy to say what came to our mind. You know. Um, we as the commission identified a particular challenge and a problem and we were humble enough to say that even our collective wisdom uh, let us put a due process to enable us to arrive at a particular decision which a process would be transparent we realize the diversity of the views from all our stakeholders, which comes out very clearly in the report, that yes, we remain with diverse opinions and views. But we then said, let us seek a, an independent autonomous authority to advise on the matter. And therefore we thank uh, Justice Musinek and the team that we actually have received the counsel. And so the next questions that have been 
uh, raised by both uh, Sister Natasha and uh, Sister Mbad. They now are saying, what are you going to do? And this is where we are saying as the commission, allow us to retreat so that we can properly apply ourselves ourselves to this uh, uh, comprehensive report and document that is before us. We don't want to do, uh, uh, no, we, we want to do justice to it. We, what we've done is we had uh, various options. Ordinarily what happens is when a report is done, it's delivered to the a commissioning authority, and then you shake a hand with the party that has prepared the report and say, I'm going to apply myself quietly. And then you only come out later if you ever do. We've done it unconventionally to say, this has been a people's process, transparent and in the hands of the South African stakeholders. As soon as justice you complete, let's release the report. Let's all apply ourselves to it. But for us, we will be looking at the questions, you know, uh, that are now pertinent. That what are the next steps? And in the time we've heard, which was only a, a mid morning today and preparing uh, for this media, we have not yet converged. And as the commission, we've worked on collective determination of things. We've converged on that. Let us make it public. Let us share it with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with everybody while we take the time to have a look at it and apply ourselves appropriately before we come to any uh, conclusion. Now, I think, Natasha, the question as to whether we're concerned about the constitutional amendment, and I stand to be corrected. But my understanding is that that is one option. However, in terms of the report, there's no requirement for the amendment. What we are required to do is to consider to approach the appropriate uh, uh, competent court and place our case as we have done you know, in the cases of the by, by elections. And uh, now, there are also other questions that are outside our competency. I think what we have here is the, the best that we could receive in terms of advice, but nobody can guarantee, not even the department responsible for a, 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 a immunization could guarantee that we will have the uh, the community uh, head that is requisite. However, I think we need to take a much more optimistic position and which is the, on the basis of the evidence that has been before us to then say what we make of uh, Justice Musineke's uh, conclusions with respect to that. Um, and the issues that relate to all the pending operational matters which you've observed through that there's an implication for the registration date, there's an implication for uh, what you call proclamation. All those issues is what we now will be deliberating as the commission so that we can come back and inform all the uh, stakeholders as well as the public. Uh, now, it's also similar to the issue of that if the commission is minded to accept the report, then the commission will have to then approach the courts. But at this stage, I think I would allow that the colleagues that we do have the opportunity to have a genuinely to apply ourselves uh, uh, to this. Um, indeed, uh, 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 the the, the, the situation, there's, there's, there's a disruption. But I think we now have a structured uh, 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 process and reports for us to say, how do we manage these challenges that we've been dealing with of uncertainty and so on and so forth? 
because it hasn't been a straightforward situation to manage the situation. But I think we can say that uh, the team led by our CEO has actually served us as the commission and our country to navigate the challenges that have been before us. And I believe that we will usher the right direction based on the report and the recommendations and the other operational considerations that are before us. And I suppose I've tried uh, Dr. Masu, okay. and if there's anything that uh, our colleagues could. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much. Uh, I see Mbali, you want to come back? Please do. If someone can uh, get the mic, the mic mm -hmm. there. Okay. Please remember to sanitize the, the mic. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mbali again from Newsroom Africa. Um, my question is to Justice Musaneke. Uh, you were quite adamant on uh, selecting uh, no, uh, no longer than February 2022 as the most appropriate time uh, to hold uh, the local government elections. I know you said you based, uh, you know, uh, your report on mostly what medical experts had to say. How confident are you, uh, you know, based on your report that February uh, is the time that no longer than February that these elections need to take place? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Natasha, you want to come back? Thank you. Thanks, Riley. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Mr. Mashinini, can you just please um, answer my question on online uh, voter registration? And then uh, furthermore, in terms of, I know you had said that the commission still needs to apply its mind on Justice Moseneke's report, but will there be any financial implications if elections are postponed already? The budget of the commission was cut by, I think, 35 million rand, correct me if I'm wrong. And the reason why um, the IEC has one voter registration is also because of budget constraints. So, um, yeah, just those two questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Franz? Francis over here. Thank you so much. Um, the question on visual elections has not been answered. I wanted to check on that, uh, considering that we are in another um, industrial trajectory, which is the 4IR. How possible is that? Have you considered that as the electoral commission? And maybe again, um, on the postponement of the possible postponement of the elections, is it even possible to postpone beyond the recommended time? I, I, um, the recommended period, uh, which is in 2022. Uh, I understand Chief uh, the Justice Musaneke has in, uh, stated that uh, his report is not uh, compulsory or mandatory. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm sure. going to start with, with yes. your justice. <clears throat> Should I go to Wedia? Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's a sh nice short question, and uh, I think the answer should be we're dealing with probabilities, not with certainty. Yes. In other words, if, if Dr. Masuku and other experts say to us we will have Head immunity or near head immunity in February. So you go to the shortest point for a remedy. It's quite a well established principle. If there's, there's some impediment, you go and look at the, the shortest safe place where you could actually perform in terms of the law. So if, was it Mbali who, who asked the question? Yes. If, if, um, Mr. Tani, if you wanted to have an adjournment of local government elections for 12 months, you're going to see any court raising their head and saying, why? What for? And why do you leave people who are unelected that long in office? I think I've made all those points. 
And by the way, the report will be on our website. So later today, you can have some bedtime reading. But we do, <laughs> Mr. Tani explained that we said a number of reasons why February. Remember I said why February and put them there, boom, boom, boom. We've had a bad local government right experience, time to reset. So you don't give them time longer than there to, even if money is allocated for a new municipality, it will kick in in July and financial year starts around April. So you would like the new people to come in in Malise Corona when I'm Mr. Tan. <laughs> so th those are powerful considerations that you don't want to leave. You heard me say some people said no councillor should have one more day in their positions. So it is, and also to deal with the impression that you put to say that aren't some people looking for an electoral advantage out of this? I don't know. But what I know is, and that's the basis of the report, you want to save lives. And you have large collection of doctors who tell you the best time you can save lives, this is the this is the open, this is the window. And most of that is driven by hopefully immunity. But the numbers, as I've you've seen in the report, are much, much higher than meets the eye, as I've said. So yeah, you should try and save lives. And we should have elections the soonest, but not at all costs. That's the point that I've been made. So I hope you'll find time to look at the whole report. And um, as I said, it might make good bedtime reading. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Justice. I am going to ask uh, the, the, the CEO of the Electoral Commission to deal with the following question. The question around e-registration, the question on um, the financial implications to the Electoral Com uh, um, Commission. Should the Commission be minded to um, adopt the recommendations of uh, Chief, um, um, Chief Justice um, Saneke? I think I've just given you uh, a, a, a new designation, uh, Justice in Senec. Okay. And That's then uh, if you can please uh, also um, talk about the, the, the road we've tra traversed um, around uh, electronic voting. Uh, thank you, CEO. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner Masuku. The issue of online registration, it was never intended to be a, a replacement modality for registration. It is in fact a complementary um, uh, system we introduced. So the, the physical registration of voters possibly at registration stations. Okay. Just put it up. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I thought I'm preaching. <laughs> <laughs> but the point uh, that I was making is that the online registration was never conceptualized as a replacement modality. It is in fact a complementary modality to supplement existing methods. It does not, cannot in and of itself um, replace physical uh, forms of registration. The access to the digital economy in our country is uneven, and therefore it can never be that uh, online registration is the sole uh, mechanism of registering people. Indeed, there will be budget implications, but the Commission is alive to the fact that South Africa is in a less than ideal fiscal position. And in calculating the impact and making requests to Treasury, we'll take options that, that uh, don't demand uh, handsomely on the national fiscals. So we'll try to be as reasonable as we ought to be given the competing social needs uh, in the country. But there is no doubt that there would be uh, budget implications. In so far as electronic voting is concerned, is it possible before uh, the local this local government elections? The short answer is no. 
Um, but this is a matter that has been uh, on our side, on our line of sight for a very long time now. Um, we started by doing a cross-national um, research to, uh, and to, to tr try to draw some insights as to what evidence from those dur dur jurisdictions um, was saying to us. We had a national a conference with all political uh, role players um, and we attempted to introduce a, an enabling provision in the Electoral Laws Amendment Bill, which would have allowed us to do a, um, which would have allowed us to, to do a, a pilot in select wards across the country. But when we were before the portfolio committee, they, uh, almost all political parties in the portfolio committee didn't see the issue in the same way as we did. Um, the portfolio committee called for more discussion before we even get to the, to the pilot stage. But does that take the matter of the national agenda? Yeah. Certainly not. The matter remains, is within our line of sight and will spare no effort to ensure that once there's national consensus on the matter, um, we move to a form of electronic voting that is suitable for South African circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, CEO. Um, I believe uh, we have covered all uh, the, the questions. It now remains for me to uh, thank, um, especially uh, Justice Msenegi and your team, uh, just to reiterate what uh, Commissioner Mashini has said, to say thank you very much for this moment. Um, it's, I remember the 20th of, um, of May very, very vividly in my mind. And that he could have traversed all the submissions that we have and uh, gotten us here is um, so typically uh, South African and so typically uh, the kind of standards that we are used to uh, in, this, in, in this country. We thank you for that. We thank you for your diligence. We thank you for um, the sharpness of, uh, of the recommendations. And then to turn uh, to um, the, the, the media, I also wish to thank you for always hitting the call to come here. You do it because on our own, we cannot get to the message out there. On our own, we could not have garnered the, the submissions that we, that we did. We did so with your help. You brought people, uh, Justice and Seneca, so that uh, they could uh, engage with uh, Justice and Seneca, put their views forward, be heard, and today we have a report. So I thank you profusely on behalf of the Electoral Commission. And of course, to uh, members of the Electoral Commission, uh, if I were to allow, uh, uh, be allowed to thank you, we'd probably be here until the following day. Just to say, uh, it's always amazing to see what it is that you do and what you put yourself through for this country. And I want to be the first and standing on a mountain to say thank you very much for your work, for your dedication, for everything that you sacrifice in order to service this nation. Uh, and with those words, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to bring this press conference to a conclusion and wish you safety. The COVID-19 is still a reality, folks. Don't get tired of wearing your masks. If you can double mask, all the better. And please sanitize. And thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, that's